I've thought a lot about tonight's teaching, and I don't mean to imply by that that I don't think about other ones. I've had this idea brewing in the back of my mind for a long time, and uh, I chose the title carefully, and I hope before we're done that you'll see this is not just some brainwave. This is something deeply rooted in the teaching of the Scriptures. The covenant of marriage and the glory of God. Why staying married is not primarily about staying in love. I don't mean to imply that being in love has nothing to do with marriage. And you'll see that before we're done. But I do stand by that. For two Christian people, staying married is absolutely not primarily about staying in love. And I want to show you before we're done why God's way is a better arrangement. Two texts. They're very important texts. Genesis 2.24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And then Ephesians 5, 31 and 32. I don't think I need to go over all the background again. We've had at least three or four weeks going through the Genesis text. So I don't think if you just came tonight and this is your first time, you might think, well, what right do you have to rip one verse out of a chapter from Genesis chapter 2? And all I can say is if you go online or see the teachings, we've gone right through those passages pretty carefully and taken more time than some people would like, I'm sure. Ephesians 5, 31 and 32. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And if you have that, verse 31 of Ephesians 5, and you have it listed right below Genesis 2.24, you're going to notice something. What you're going to notice is, word for word, they are the same. Ephesians 5.32. This mystery is profound. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Let's just pray together. We just got singing, Your word is a lamp unto my feet. And there's nowhere where this is more obviously precious than where we come to a subject like this and your word reveals something that we could never, ever discover on our own. Where your word reveals something tonight about marriage that we could never learn from any educator, any counselor, any therapist. Our culture could never teach us this about marriage. And so we come to the revelation of your word tonight to discover something that only you could tell us. And if it weren't you telling us, we wouldn't believe it about the meaning of marriage. And so especially when your word cuts into our hearts with truth that is foreign to the thinking of our world, we need spiritual perception and understanding to grasp what you're revealing to us. So come, Holy Spirit, and be the teacher. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The reason this series was called The Meaning of Marriage and not How to Have a Good Marriage is rooted in my conviction that most marriages end not because people lack the skills to make them better, but they end because people didn't apply those skills when they could have. They chose not to. And the reason they didn't work at it and the reason they didn't apply those skills to the saving of their marriage was they didn't choose to. And the reason they didn't choose to is because they didn't want to. And the reason they didn't want to is they never, ever understood They never understood what they did when they got married. They think they did, but they never understood what marriage is.
And if we allow the producers and the novelists and the comedians, there's probably people who stayed home tonight watching the Oscars. If you let those people and their movies tell you what marriage is, you're miles from what God says marriage is. Miles from it. Even if they have good marriages. Because they don't know what marriage is. And if we let the comedians and the therapists and the educators and the producers define marriage for us, we will always make it smaller and less significant than God says it is. And if we make marriage smaller than God says it is, we will think more lightly both about entering into marriage and about getting out of marriage than God wants us to think. But it won't be because we're stupid. It'll be because we never grasped what marriage was. What I want to say by way of introduction is, let me rid your mind of some false ideas. Marriage is not, first of all, about finding companionship. It is not. Marriage isn't, first of all, about being in love. And it isn't, first of all, about producing children. And it isn't, first of all, about finding fulfillment. And it isn't, first of all, about finding joy. And it isn't, first of all, about completing yourself in any other sense of the word. And if, when you think of marriage, whether you're presently single and one day maybe going to be married or whether you're presently married yourself, if you're thinking primarily about finding love or joy or happiness or companionship or fulfillment, you're programming that marriage for failure. What we're going to study tonight, and there's only two points. I know I'm taking a little while setting it up. What we're going to study tonight is something we would never discover apart from revelation from our Creator. We could, we could not ever know this unless God revealed it to us. And what that means is for us to understand what God says marriage is requires a radical departure from the thinking of our culture. Here's why this matters. It matters because the vision you bring to your marriage is crucial to how you will behave in your marriage. No one will for very long apply difficult skills of communication and forgiveness. No one will apply those skills to marriage if he or she doesn't have a lofty vision of what marriage actually is. And so before we tell people how to build a marriage or save a marriage, we must make sure that they know how precious it is and what is the nature of the relationship that they're in. Here's where I want to go tonight, and I'm still not at point one, but don't worry. To start laying the groundwork for what I'm going to say in just a minute. I need to step back from marriage and just look at this whole created world of which marriage is a, a, a part, but the whole created world. I mean, everything that you see, feel, experience, everything around you that exists. Everything that happens in this created world is designed to make us think of God. I view that as being a foundational truth. We're going to build on it. Because this world didn't just happen, because it had a designer and a maker and a creator and everything in it, I mean absolutely everything that happens is designed to point us toward God in some way. Forget about marriage just for a minute. Every time a leaf falls from a branch, every time the trees turn red in autumn and leaves fall off the trees, 
We're to be reminded by our Creator of the passing of seasons and the passing of time. Eternity is coming after each one of us. I don't know how old you are, but think of it this way. You might have 15 more springs and falls that you're going to see. And God put seasons there so that you and I, if we're alert, we see what he does and we count, we count down the clock. Every time a leaf falls from a tree, we should notice what God's doing. Every time you pick a blueberry, we should pause and think about our provider and the way he sustains and feeds and cares for us. There's not a scientist in the world who can grow a blueberry but for God. Every time it rains, we're to remember how God's grace falls on the just and on the unjust. Every time an earthquake strikes Haiti or Chile, we're to remember with pain that we don't live in a world that is presently as good as God originally created it. The people who just want to gripe and whine about why God allows these things always talk as though the world as it exists now is the way God originally made it, and it's not. It's not an unbroken chain from creation to where we are now. It's a broken chain. God didn't break it. We're reminded of the tragic consequences of the fall, and we're reminded that we don't have the power in ourselves to turn off the effects of the fall in this world. You tell me who you know who can stop an earthquake. We're to think about that. Every time terrorists fly planes into buildings, we're to see how sin sucks sinners into deeper depravity than anyone could ever imagine, and we're to see how innocent, I didn't say sinless, I said innocent people are often involved in the sins of others and are affected by it. We're to cry out for a redeemer. Every time we hold a baby, we're to marvel at the creative work of God in the womb. I, I love this time of year where you just start. It's not quite the same as summer, but you just start to notice in the evening you see the sun and you get that goldy kind of look in the sky. You don't get that in just the same way. Or every time you look into deep space, we're to stand in awe at the power and the glory of our Creator. The point is, everything that God has made, including marriage, but everything that God has made. He has made in order to put himself on display in some way, some facet of his being, some aspect of his work. Stuff doesn't just happen. There's a God, and he reveals himself, and he shows us things about himself. Everything you and I see, feel, hear, an experience in one way or another, everything, the breath in your lungs is about God. And the Bible just, the Bible just reverberates that truth like an echo through the Grand Canyon. Let me just read these to you. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power, and the glory, and the victory, and the majesty, for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. You are exalted as head above all. What a wonderful text that is. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky proclaims His handiwork. Colossians, He, speaking of Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Jesus made, you know, you, you got, you got the, 
the atom and the electrons and the neutrons and the protons and all the little subatomic particles and the quirks and quarks and everything else. Jesus made those. He made those. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything, that in everything, he might be preeminent. Okay, so because this world has a creator, everything that happens is designed to turn our thoughts to him in one way or another. The created world exists to put God on display and... That's not arrogant of God. For me to put myself on display is pride and arrogance because I'm fallen, I'm a sinner, and I'm not a safe example for anyone to follow. For God to put himself on display is not arrogance. It's arrogance for me to put myself on display because I'm not worthy of it, and other people will mess up worshiping me. But when God puts himself on display in everything in this universe, when he designs it so that it all points to him, that's not an act of pride, it's an act of love. Because he is absolutely pure, spotless, just, holy, lovely in every way, and our lives are best orbited around him. It's gracious of God to say, look at me. It's arrogant of me or you to say, Look at me. We, we, we were all designed to be worshipers of something. This was brought... It's amazing how sometimes teaching moments, the Holy Spirit shows you things when you least expect it. And the, uh, I was thinking about that hockey game, the Canada-US one, and, and I didn't get to see it, at least not much of it, because I was here. And... Uh, but I saw it on the news. I was sitting there and reading was upstairs and I was watching the news and they were showing the theme of it was how this, this just unites the whole country. You know, we're all somehow brothers and sisters doing a group hug. You know, that, that'll last four weeks. But, but the theme was what a great event this was. And so they showed the, I guess it was an overtime, the winning goal, and what they had, you've seen this before, so you've got your big screen, the television, and then they've got little screens, so there's about 20 shots of places all over the world, so in Canada, in Thunder Bay, in Toronto, in Vancouver, in Philadelphia, in London, England, in Germany, and all these places, and so you're seeing people, uh, usually in bars, great big beer bellies, sitting there with their booze, and they're, and they're all sitting there watching the hockey game, and then that goal is scored. And the camera isn't on the hockey. The camera's on the people gathered in all these places. And without exception, without exception, in every case, when that goal was scored, especially, of course, on the Canadian side of things, the reaction was exactly the same. You see the people, they're watching, they're watching, they're on the edge of their seat, and then the goal is scored. You know what everybody does? What everybody does. They do this, they go... Hey! You see my hands? And I, and I thought instantly, just, I wasn't even planning it. Instantly I thought, where did they learn that? I mean, why do they do that? And I'll tell you why. Because whether they ever acknowledge him or not, they're created. And they're created to worship. They don't all worship God. But every person on this planet is a worshiper. And the people that will mock and poke fun of Christians and how fanatical they get with their God. All of them. So we're all designed, we're all created to worship something. The only thing that keeps your life safe and on track is when the ultimate object of your worship is is God. Now that truth applies to every part of our lives. It's much bigger than the subject of marriage, but it applies to marriage very directly, and that's what I want to get into now with two quick thoughts. One, the purpose of marriage 
is to magnify God's reach of grace in Christ Jesus. The purpose of marriage is to magnify God's reach of grace in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to look at those two texts again, even if you think you haven't memorized. I want you to see something. Genesis 2.24, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Then Paul's words. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Now, we know there's a relationship between the words of, I'm going to say, Moses in Genesis 2.24 and the words of Paul in Ephesians 5.31-32. We know there's a connection because the words are repeated. The very same words are repeated. Here's a question. And the answer that you give reveals your understanding of what marriage is. What was God planning before he planned the institution of marriage? I mean, Paul specifically says there's a, there's a mystery. In fact, he says it's a profound mystery. A profound mystery. Those are the words Paul uses. Pushing through before and behind the marriage of Adam and Eve, there was another mystery that was being revealed. In other words, something was happening. Something was happening with Adam and Eve in the garden. Something was being revealed that Moses didn't fully grasp. Okay? And Adam and Eve didn't fully grasp. And here's what Paul says was happening. God first planned, this is really important, God first planned on sending Jesus Christ to redeem the race that he knew would fall into sin in the garden. That was plan A. Then, then, after God had that plan... He created man and woman in marriage so that we could have a visible picture of the union that would exist between Jesus Christ and his revealed and his redeemed church. In other words, before God planned marriage, he planned redemption in Christ. And then after that idea was in place to redeem to redeem uh, mankind through Christ. After that plan was established, then God created man and woman in marriage so that there would be a picture of that plan, a picture of a Christ who is presently invisible to this world, and they could see a manifestation of how God's grace works. So Christ's covenant with his church is the reality. Marriage is the illustration of that reality. Paul says that when God planned marriage between a man and a woman, he did it to illustrate what he had already planned to do between Christ and his bride, the church. Now, that's absolutely clear when you look at Paul's words. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Okay, what's Paul talking about there? A man shall leave his father and mother, and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. What's he talking about? And marriage is what I want to say. But that's the wrong answer. He's not talking about marriage. And he makes that clear. Verse 32, this mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it, it refers to Christ and the church. Look at that little word, it. I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. What, what refers to Christ and his church? What's the it? Well, the it can only refer back to verse 31. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, the two shall become one flesh. Are you talking about, mar about marriage? No, Paul says. I'm not. I'm talking about redemption. 
I'm talking about the relationship that exists between Christ and his church. If you are married right now, or if you are going to get married soon, there's only one reason you're going to be married. And it is so that on this planet, where Jesus is presently invisible, there will be a picture to everyone of the kind of covenant Christ created with his church. That's why marriage exists. I'm going to show you in a minute why that's really important. Where does the relationship between a husband and wife get its meaning? How do we know what that relationship is? I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Every time, every time there's a woman caught in an abusive marriage. Every time there's a man who's home alone and his wife is unfaithful. We always talk about the man being unfaithful, so I'm just flipping it so that we, it's both parties. Every time people find themselves in marriages like that, it's because, it's because they don't know what marriage is. And so they don't know what it's supposed to look like. They don't know. So here's the first truth the Bible reveals. And the world, for the most part, doesn't know. And Christians, for the most part, forget. If you're married at all, that's the reason you are married. It's to display visibly to this God-created world, the relationship that exists between Christ and his church. Now, I want to lead into the closing truth, the second truth. Staying married is not primarily about staying in love. Okay, now that we know what marriage is, now that we know what it is, the meaning of marriage, the next question we need to ask is, what does that meaning imply about the marriage relationship. What is... If that's what marriage is, it's a visible picture that God designed to display the love Jesus has for his church. If that's what marriage is, what is, what is, it, that, what is it that holds a marriage together? What is it that holds a marriage together? What is, what is the nature of this bond, this, this cleaving? What is it that holds it intact? Can we walk away from it? Is it held together by romance? Is the bond that holds the marriage together sexual passion? Is it the need for companionship? Is marriage held together by the mutual pursuit of self-fulfillment or happiness? Is the union going to be held together by the standards and practices of this culture? Can we switch partners when we so desire? Do we stay married as long as we stay in love? Do we leave when we love someone else more? Do we leave when our partner loves someone else more? What holds this, Paul says, this mystery? What holds it together? The issues really are addressed in those words in Ephesians 5, 31 and 32. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I'm saying, Paul says, and not just Paul, but the Holy Spirit, I'm saying that it, that marriage, refers to Christ and his church. And the bond that exists between Christ and his church, we celebrated it this morning. I don't know if you thought about it. The bond that exists between Christ and his church is the bond of a covenant. It's the bond of a covenant that Jesus purchased with his life. Do 
Luke 22, 20, and likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant. The new covenant. Covenant in my blood. Christ established his covenant by paying for it with the laying down of his life. That's what Christ paid to be joined to his bride. So marriage is sustained. Let's, let's review. My marriage, your marriage. If you're single, the marriage you may be pursuing, the marriage you will one day have. Its primary meaning is it's to visibly display the relationship Jesus has with his church. And so we learn from that that marriage is sustained not by romance, not by joy, not by fulfillment, and not even by love, but by covenant. Jesus will never, ever desert his bride. Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Please stay with me through this whole series, by the way. I'm going to talk a lot about divorce, divorce and remarriage, and it's not the unpardonable sin. But I want to lay down some foundations about marriage. The covenant that Jesus makes with his church is a life covenant. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's what my marriage is supposed to picture, Paul says. It's supposed to put on display the union that exists between Christ and his church. It's the unbreakable nature of a covenant that makes it different from a couple of other things. Sometimes just words. We need to look at just the meaning of words. It's the covenant of marriage that makes it different from a decision. We, uh, a few years back, talking about marriage and needing something to hold marriage together, my wife was redoing the family room. And she had a color all picked out, and we had looked at these charts. Guys, you know that look you get on your face where they bring you 16 shades of beige? And they think there's a difference in those things. And I would be reading or I'd be watching golf and she would bring this thing in and you like, uh, and then colors don't even have names anymore that are colors, you know. I can't stand it. It's like teas when you go into Starbucks. Do you want serenity or do you want, I'm saying serenity is not a flavor. Serenity is a state of mind. Chocolate is a flavor. Don't give me serenity. I don't know what serenity tastes like. And so now there's, there's, uh, you know, wheat pistachio beige and burnt cinnamon beige. And, and I look at them and I go, I don't care. They're good. They're all good. And so on, on one wall, on one wall I have, it's, it's really the only part of the house that's mine. I told you that when, one day that she was out and I, I had taken the clock and I moved it from one shelf and I put it on the other shelf in the family room and I was sitting in there and she came in and she had tea with her for me and for her. We sat down and she looked around and I could see her looking up where the clock where I'd put it. And she said, what's, you have to hear the way she does this. What's that? What's that? And I just know immediately. I, I don't know what I was thinking. I'm sorry. I have no idea what was in my hand. Why are you using those towels? I don't know. I was wet. I was naked. There was a towel. I, I don't know what I was thinking. Those towels are not for you. <laughs> Have you anybody heard that speech? If you come to my house, you can use those towels. So I have this little part. Oh, and anyway, but back to the clock thing. And she, and she said, she said, I'm not kidding. I, I, she's, she said to me these words. 
when you have your own house, you can decorate it however you want. So she painted, she picked a color, painted the family room, and my part in this was I have, I have about seven of these narrow, um, narrow tower CD cases. My CDs are my, actually it's the only part of the house that's mine. And I took them all off and put them in boxes because they had to be pulled out from the wall where she was painting, and I put them all in boxes, and I put them all in alphabetical order because I have classical music and jazz by composers and... And it took ages, and I got them all in boxes, hundreds of them. Move the shelves. She painted. And we were also getting a new love seat at the same time. You can probably see where this is going. She asked me my opinion on the love seat. And as long as, you know, we don't have to go over 150 bucks for a love seat, I'm good with it. You can't get a good love seat for 150 bucks anymore. So we painted the, she painted, we, she painted the whole room, and it dried. And I put the shelves back against the wall. And I took all the CDs out of the boxes, one at a time, dusted them off, put them all, hundreds of them, in alphabetical order, got them all on the shelves. Everything was perfect. And then the love seat came. And they brought in the love seat and they put it against the wall. And I was just finishing and the CDs looked perfect. I was just finishing and Rini came in and there was the love seat against the wall and she said, oh, that's not going to work. <laughs> what, what, what do you... What? It doesn't work. You sit on it. It holds you up. It... <laughs> and she decided that it had to be... We had the wrong shade of beige and we had to do another shade of beige now that the love seat was there. That's the nature of a decision. Okay, A decision is you, you put brown carpet down, you get back, you decide you don't like it, and as long as you have the money, you rip out the brown carpet and you put in blue carpet. That's a decision. That's not a covenant. That's not a covenant. Why, well, Pastor Don, we got married and, and it was a mistake. We never should have gotten married. And they're treating it like it was a decision, but it wasn't a decision. <laughs> we're, not, we're not picking carpet here. This was a covenant. Now, the word that's similar is a contract. A contract means I do certain things, you do certain things, and we protect each other. You meet your obligations, and I meet my obligations. And no one's left out in the cold. I don't have to keep my obligations if you don't keep your obligations. Marriage isn't a contract. The lawyers will tell you it's a contract. And all the prenups will tell you it's a contract. But it's not a contract. God, God made marriage. God made marriage, and it's a covenant. And you make a covenant to protect yourself from changing your mind. It's a covenant. What is it that holds a marriage together? Is it love? Is it romance? Is it fulfillment? No, no. He gave his covenantal love for us. This is how different it is from a contract. My marriage, which is to picture the relationship between Christ and his church, should reveal this, that he gave his covenantal love for me while I had nothing whatsoever to bring to the table. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. So those are the two fundamental revelations about marriage in God's word. You, you can't understand what the marriage relationship is until you understand these things. First, marriage, like everything else in God's creation, marriage is designed to point everyone to God. It's designed to point everyone to God. It can't be redefined. We may make all sorts of different relationships legal. We're heading down all sorts of weird paths. 
but it, it ultimately belongs to God. And secondly, what marriage is designed by God to display in particular is his covenantal love revealed in the laying down of Christ for his church. It displays the covenantal love of the one who said to a sin-broken, self-infested bride, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Every marriage in this room, let me just talk to married people for a minute. Every marriage in this room is made on a basis of covenant, not romance, not decision, not contract. Covenant that displays the love of Christ for his church. And if you are considering marriage, if you are considering marriage, be sure you're pursuing someone who is more interested in Jesus Christ than they are in you. Because then you'll have a covenant that will last. And everyone said? Amen.